Hello, we are back. So next up is one quick talk library ecosystem where, well, it'll be a bit shorter than what's on the schedule, but the basic idea is we're looking at the big picture of like what we're doing here in the course and preparing for it tomorrow. So in HackMD, there's two initial questions here. So what other Python packages do you use? Write the name and a short description of them. And then has anyone else ever used your work? And we'll come back to this in a little bit. And in the meantime, I will switch to the course page, my screen. So here we go to library ecosystem. Uh, so there's this good quote I had from someone. I was asking people, what do you know now about uh, computational research or scientific computing that you wish someone had told you when you first started? And the student answered, Okay, so when you're a student, like undergraduate student, you're expected to do everything yourself and it's how you evaluate it. And if you reuse something someone else done, that's plagiarism. When you become a researcher, you have to be able to reuse what others have done. Otherwise, you just can't do your work and you don't have much practice in this. So that's sort of the theme of this short talk here. So this whole ecosystem of different packages. So um, there's maybe two different types of things that you might use. One is well-maintained libraries that are used by others. So say NumPy, SciPy, Jupyter, um, these kind of things. These you can re re really expect that they work. And then there's a whole bunch of other code, which is uh, written by others, maybe for an article or something like that, but it's not really well maintained and who knows if it even works well. So, yeah. There's some common terms that you might have been hearing here. So library is a collection of code used by a program. If it's a package, then it's been made easily installable and reusable and is often published on things like the Python package index. So this is what's used by pip install to install things. Another public repository is the Anaconda cloud, which has things like ConduForge. So when you do conda install, it takes from there. And a dependency is a requirement of another program not included in that program. So actually tomorrow we talk about turning your code into packages. And also we talk about handling dependencies. So I believe at least Simo's talking about the handling dependencies and I forget who's talking about packaging. But those are actually pretty useful things to do, even if you're just working on code yourself. So having it be a little bit chaotic, less chaotic is really useful. So make sure you come back for that. But let's talk about the bigger ecosystem. So when people say SciPy ecosystem, there is one big library called SciPy and that wraps a bunch of, what was it that it wraps? GNU scientific library or? Well, a huge host of libraries. There's like a plus yeah. libraries uh, for linear algebra. There's uh, yeah. FFT libraries for Fourier transforms and all mm -hmm. of the functions that use these kinds of things. So if you want to do a convolution or something like that, yeah. uh, in, underneath it, it uses uh, FFT to, to yeah. create uh, this thing. So all of the mathematical fu uh, functionality uses some lower level libraries to do the calculations. Yeah. And here, this is what we could call sort of the core packages of the SciPy ecosystem. And it's called SciPy ecosystem, even though SciPy is just one of the packages in it. Of course, first there's Python, there's NumPy that has the arrays, there's SciPy that builds on NumPy. So NumPy holds the arrays and SciPy has functions that work on those arrays. Matplotlib does the plotting 
And then there's a lot of other plotting things that build on that as a backend. There's pandas, which is the data frame data structure for tidy data, which uses NumPy. And then there's IPython and Jupyter for interactive work. And the, no. um, I would want to say that like you cannot stress enough how important this is for scientific computing uh, and Python, because like if you think about Python, Python is uh, was invented in 1991, so over 30 years ago. So when people think about, okay, Python is a new thing or something, well, nowadays probably don't, but 10 years ago, people were like, okay, Python is a, like an upcoming thing that's uh, conquering mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. But it, it's really these packages that have enabled it to conquer the world. Like in the 90s, people weren't using Python for scientific computing because they weren't effective packages <laughs> for for this but nowadays yeah. because of these packages enable one to use python as this kind of uh, uh collect them all thing swiss army knife that, yeah swiss yeah. army knife definitely yeah, a toolbox that you can use to do all kinds of things that is really the the core thing about python yeah. uh, and scientific computing so i uh, guess you can say python is bad for scientific computing but it has good libraries that make it good yeah I, I would actually nowadays even add tensorflow uh, slash pytorch mm. to this list because so much yeah. stuff is now going on with machine learning that this is almost yeah, yeah. this should in my opinion should be added yeah to that ecosystem list yeah okay but i still think that's like more special purpose than these which is like yeah across every domain but okay let's go on so there's a huge list of different libraries here. So our point isn't to read all of these things because you can read later just as well as I can read now, but it just goes to show that like how big the different breadth of things are here. Um, so yeah, but let's get to this interesting part here, which is connecting Python to other languages. So what the way things like SciPy and NumPy work, they're not actually written in the Python that you know. They're written in C that uses a Python interface. And if you go and you search the Python docs for the C API, that's what these things really do. And through the C API, they can link to other languages like Fortran or whatever else when there's existing stuff in those languages. So we don't need to go into detail there, but there's two main terms you might hear sometime. One is extending Python, and that's writing your own modules in C or some language which Python can import. And the other is embedding Python, which is you have some other application in uh, some like C or whatever, and you have Python go inside of that, where your other application is the primary thing. So then Python becomes like a, um, a scripting language inside of your program. But we don't need to go any more details there. Just realize that it is there. There are also like these kinds of uh, like, like very popular projects such as Cython uh, mentioned there as well and uh, Namba for example, that basically like you write code that reminds you of Python. It's similar to Python, but underneath it, it converts all of the Python stuff into C and then it runs yeah. it on C. And that's usually much faster, but then you also have to like deal with the added complication of compilation and stuff like that, that uh, comes with these static languages such as C. Yeah. Uh... Yeah. So basically, if you do have some library written in another language, there's actually pretty easy ways to use it to extend Python without even having to know the Python C API. So the last part of this is evaluating packages for reuse. And there's some things you can um, consider here. Like, is it actually released or is it code on someone's website? Are the dependencies actually recorded? Is the code stable enough? Like, are the authors randomly changing it um, while you're using it? 
are there automated tests and so on. And this is actually um, many of these things are considered in a code refinery course, which we should think here. But it basically teaches you like how to make your code so that it's usable by others. Oh, actually, here's the link to Code Refinery. But before you go taking some random code you see somewhere, it's worth thinking about this and understanding what the risk might be. Yeah, so I've already, well, this first one here, let's see what people have written in HackMD. And about the risk, I will quickly mention that there's, uh, like, Nowadays, especially if you're working with something that goes into the internet, like something that connects to the internet, if you create a web API or something, uh, there is a growing tendency in software world of these kinds of like uh, attack by by these kinds of like packages, basically, <laughs> like uh, that that somebody has access to some package and then they can bring systems down because mm -hmm. like they install a a version of the package that has some vulnerability in it or like yeah uh, they can do stuff like that so so usually you don't have to think about it when you're doing scientific computing but still it's good idea to like remind yourself that whenever you're using something created by others you are trusting them <laughs> and they, and you're extending your trust to them that yeah. their code uh does uh, what it says it uh, does yeah. and of course it's in most cases you can trust like it, science is all about trust we trust our researchers to to be good faith when they publish a research or something like that mm -hmm. we trust uh, the, the publishers we trust uh, software creators but you need to sometimes verify or be certain about it uh, of which so, so I wouldn't install a random uh, Git, yeah, uh, like a package know. without like checking who is the author or, yeah. or what is in inside the package and doing stuff like that. Yeah. So let's see. There's some good example packages here. Yeah. Email. By the way. Uh, Tamu, if you're listening, we're almost ready for web APIs to start. Yeah, network and, X I've used a lot. I'll also mention here that like there are usually more than one package for one application. They might be like somebody has created a package, that package doesn't have a functionality that somebody else wants, and then they create a fork of the original package or they create their own implementation of the thing. And it's, it's usually not bad to have multiple things uh, doing the same thing. Like competition breeds creativity usually. So, uh, to, and using one of them doesn't make you like worse person if you choose the wrong option or something like that. If you back the wrong horse, it, that uh, happens all the time. If there even is the wrong option. Yes, yes. Uh, that, like that it, I think mo most of the times there is not really a wrong option. There might be the non for this is not really best option, but it's not really a wrong option as such. Yes. Most often. Yeah, like like usually the main focus should be on getting what you want done done. And uh, in that sense, like even if you get it done using something that is not the most elegant or beautiful or like some perfect way might be better than just uh, creating your own package or your yeah. own uh thing for it yeah so i don't see tamu here yet uh we're ready to go to the next one uh i have an idea let's look at this evaluating packages exercise together on my screen so here we've got six different packages and I propose we go in order from least good example, or mm, yeah. So I'll open them in some order and quickly comment what you think of how they look. 
So first is this one, which incidentally I wrote long ago. Would you use this for anything? Like what's your first impression and why? Uh, honestly, my first impression would be that I there's no readme file. Yeah. I necessarily wouldn't like like know what the, what what's happening over here. So I would probably like look further. Yeah, like basically, another package. no readme file. If if I'm pointed to ago. it by some if I'm pointed to it by someone uh, that this is a good thing to use for this for a specific yeah. purpose, then I would probably head back to them and tell them, okay. If you can explain to me exactly how I have to install it, have to use it, and so, then I might use it. Yeah. But um, yeah, there is simply yeah. too little information yeah. to yeah. even. And also the the, the, like the time, the... like last update, last commit, yeah. uh, reveals that it's not necessarily yeah. like a living package anymore. Yeah. So. And I can tell you, you really well. There's some good stuff there, but you wouldn't want to use it. I I wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't. Uh, so I, I guess that the underneath, like the, there's bound to be something. Here's another one I wrote. So at least there's a readme file now. And look, a release and a citation. But it's not packaged. It's not installable. I mean, if I knew I needed it, I might try to figure it out. But otherwise, I would go on. Okay, let's look at something that's good. Uh, here we go. So I see it's relatively more active. There's a readme file, even just looking at the table of contents, who's written it, requirements, how to install it, Okay, look, I can install it from pip, how it's used. I mean, this is already looking quite good. But okay, it's time to move on. So hopefully this was an interesting observation of things.